As a creative arts therapist, almost everyone that we are going to work with has been traumatized in some way. And often, one of the major underlying issues of people with traumatic illnesses is that there are no words to describe what is going on inside. Uh, particularly with early trauma that has happened to us before we were able to speak. Uh, there literally are no words. Trauma gets processed from the first three years of our lives <clears throat> through the body and through image, uh, through the senses. And so there is no cognition around what has happened to us. And in that way, many people are trapped in their trauma memories for their whole lives. They've been in verbal therapy for years and years and years, and they know exactly what's wrong with them from a verbal perspective. But the body hasn't been able to communicate. Uh, and that's one thing that music is so powerful in being able to um, work directly from the body, particularly with singing, with improvisation. All of those memories and the emotions associated with those memories are trapped in the body. Music therapy engages the body and allows those uh, suppressed memories and feelings to be released and explored and transformed. And that's really, to me, one of the most powerful things about music therapy is that not only does it allow us to gain knowledge into the body and into our emotional lives, but it gives us the power to transform that that is destroying our uh, life force and our, our sense of joy and, uh, and ability to, uh, to live our lives to the fullest. And so the question is, how does music do that, right? Just think about it yourselves. How has music transformed your own lives? Right. Um, there's been so much research done on post-traumatic stress disorder over the last 20 years. And, and what we're finding is that not everybody who goes through trauma, like war or accidents or, or some kind of um, experience of rape or, or um, violence, not everyone gets post-traumatic stress disorder. And one of the things that scientists are finding is that people with complex trauma, people that grew up around trauma, are much more susceptible to post-traumatic stress disorder because the foundation of their personality is really shaky. You know, there's fragmentation that happens early on in the psyche when we grow up in an environment that is emotionally unstable, that is violent, where there is abandonment and neglect. And those issues really point to the, the word attachment. You know, young people who are in this kind of complex trauma environment don't really trust. They don't feel safe because they're in environments where there's inconsistent parenting. There's uh, unstable emotional um, adults in their lives that often fly off the handle and they yell and they, you know, they hit or they do other kinds of abusive behaviors. So imagine a little child who's just beginning to feel their way in the environment and have this kind of behavior going on uh, around them. Um, the sense of safety and trust never gets established. Beethoven grew up in an abusive uh, family. His father was, uh, was very violent, and his mother, according to him, was very saintly. And um, 
he was very ashamed of his father and he was shamed by his father. And so he pretended that he came from a noble family and he literally told everybody as he started to become more well known that, you know, he was from this more, you know, noble family and that, you know, he felt good about himself. And, but, but you could see underlying that kind of um, false reality was the, the suffering that he went through with um, not being accepted for who he was and, and being shamed and being hit. And I mean, anytime you hit somebody, anytime you're violent, that's shaming somebody that's saying, you know, there's something wrong with you. And a kid can never figure that out. A kid will say, well, what did I do? I didn't do anything. Why are you hurting me? So, um, and so this shame is something that you can never figure out because it's always, um, wrong. Particularly in a music therapy context, it's not just that music is healing people, it's the relationship that we develop with the clients. And the music being sort of, I like to see it kind of as a triangle. There's the patient, there's the therapist, and there's the art form that uh, work together in creating a healing solution to some of the issues that we grapple with. Um, so within that relationship, particularly when we're playing with the client, we are releasing the hormone called oxytocin. I was just reading something about autistic children and how they, uh, a lot of them have a deficit in oxytocin. And so they're born not connecting with other people and the births that, that many women have had when they've had autistic children um, have been extremely difficult. So it's so interesting to me. Um, I have an autistic nephew and as a music therapist I'm always using music but w when he was a little boy I would hold him on my lap at the piano and I would sing and play with him and in those moments where I was connecting in that way, he became normal. He, he could speak, he could, you know, he could give affection. Um, and, and I do that with him today as well, he's 13. And I still see how there's something about the intimacy that comes with the musical relationship that feeds the autistic child and um, brings them back to this sense of, of normalcy. So, uh, but in terms of trauma, that kind of intimacy is very rare, particularly in people with complex trauma. The kind of intimacy that we all crave, we've been deprived of. And so we, in fact, we're afraid of it uh, because if someone comes too close, it could remind us of when we were traumatized in some way. And so in music therapy, the music again is the intermediary. So you're not exactly touching the person, the music is touching them. And that's how you start to repair those kind of early attachment de deficits in a way that's safe for the patient. You're not forcing your way into their lives and re-traumatizing them. The music is taking care of them. Research shows that often unresolved childhood trauma manifests itself in autoimmune diseases, fibromyalgia, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, these are things that are very hard to cure without working at an emotional level. Um, and it's not that these diseases are imagined, they are absolutely diseases, but they are associated with a depleted, um, oh, well I should say an overactive autonomic nervous system, which eventually depletes. 
Okay, so uh, last week Mary talked a little bit about the brain and what happens, uh, the amygdala, which is in the limbic system of the brain. The emotional centers of the brain are overstimulated. And um, important way of um, healing trauma is building a bridge between the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of our brain, the executive functioning of the brain, and the more primitive part of the brain, the emotional brain, that doesn't have a lot of control. And again, music therapy techniques can be very useful in that way, and I'll go into that in a moment. Okay, so the other wonderful thing about music is that it's so subjective. There is no formula to heal people with music. In the beginning of my career, I, I've, ha I've had doctors call me up because I was a stress expert. They would call me and they would say, what music should I play for my clients? I'm like, well, what kind of clients do you have? I don't know, they're, they're you know, kidney patients. It's like, well, play kidney music, of course. <laughs> I, I said, well, you have to get to know them. I don't have time for that, just tell me what to play. And so I said, well, why don't you just try Pachelbel's Canon? He goes, okay, well, who wrote it? I'm like, Pachelbel? <laughs> yeah, you know, in other words, music therapy is a science. You really have to study it. You have to know music inside out. And you also have to know yourself inside out in order to be able to discriminate what is you and what is them. So, and that's true for all the arts therapies. You know, it, it's, they're sciences. They're not just, oh, we'll have fun and we'll sing some songs. You know, that's, that's having fun and singing songs. Music therapy is different. Okay, so that's um, stage one, creating safety, developing the therapeutic alliance. And once that's starting to feel safe and, and solid for you, you can move into the second stage, which has to do with the beginning stages of looking at some of the trauma memories and trauma experiences and dealing with conflict within the relationship. Because if you truly are uh, experiencing an alliance with your client, then there are going to be reenactments. Uh, in the therapeutic relationship that are going to be similar to what your client experienced with other people. Uh, and that is where the magic can happen in dealing with long-term um, personality kinds of issues and, and, and chronic pain or chronic illnesses or other kinds of chronic addictions and things like that. So one way that we start to uh, work with the body in music therapy is through what we call clinical improvisation. We use instruments as a way of exploring the, uh, the here and now moment, the impulse, the physicality of the body-mind. And I have with me here some instruments that we use as part of our practice in, in music therapy. And generally, they're instruments that are effortless to play. Like, for example, this is a rain stick. Which, but believe it or not, for uh, emotionally disturbed children, this instrument is a godsend because it relaxes them. They love that sound of rain. It's soothing and comforting. You know. And you know, in my, all of my 30 years of practice, I have never seen a kid try to hurt anyone with a rain stick. There's something, and it, you know, it looks like it could be uh, like a club of some sort, but they just realize, in fact, it's so funny, when I started working with special ed, I would ask kids, where does music come from? Music comes from nature. Music comes from God. You know, how do kids know that? You know, they know how special music is, and no one has ever told them that. So 
if a kid has that awareness of music, why not use it as a way of helping them to heal and grow? Um, drums of all sorts. different rhythms stimulating different energies within the self. And kids love to play rhythms. Um, other things that we have are um, African instruments. Um, gosh, I don't have any of my melodic instruments in here. But um, here's one. This is a kid instrument that adults really love. <laughs> you can really get into this. And you can sort of see the, you can see the difference between instruments that bring you into the body and instruments that bring you out of the body. I like these better. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you've got um, most music therapists have a guitar and a keyboard as a way of creating harmonic um, progressions that can hold the improvisations of a client or, or not. I mean, you don't always have to have an accompaniment instrument in clinical improvisation. Sometimes we just, you know, have two instruments. In fact, why don't we do a little de demonstration? This is, an, this is a, a clinical improvisation uh, exercise where we're just going to be playing together. And I am going to um, use three things that most music therapists will do in clinical improvisation. The first is to mirror sort of what the other person is playing, but not exactly what they're playing, because that would be, you know, really weird. <laughs> That's like someone just saying, really weird, and whatever you say, and whatever you say. Like, you hate that, right? <laughs> so you don't want to do that, but you want to make them know that you're really hearing them. The other is holding them. So if they're really emoting somehow through the instrument, um, you are creating a space to make sure that they are contained. And the other thing that we'll be doing is leading. If someone's sort of perseverating, we're going to want to try to break that up and give them another direction they could possibly go. So um, let me see what other instruments I can entice you with. I always think of the tambourine as kind of a joyful sort of instrument. This is a ocean drum. So does anybody feel an inclination to play one of these instruments? OK. Go for it. I used to um, play the tambourine when I oh, was in church. Fantastic. It's my favorite. I just. Wait, wait, that music takes you directly back to that limbic system, part of the brain, the hippocampus, the place where you store your life's memories. Just like that, the power of music. Any particular memory come up for you? 
No, just being in church family mm-hmm. every Sunday, gathering my Sunday dresses, mm-hmm. um, just playing with a lot of kids. That's pretty specific. Your fa- your your Sunday dresses, you know, yeah. that definitely. I can see my closet and those little dresses I used to wear and going to church on mm-hmm. Sunday as well. Yeah, and the music just brought that up for you. So that would be an example of creating a musical self-statement. You just gave us a little window into your world. I mean, think about it. If you're working with somebody who has been traumatized, abused, um, made to feel unsafe, then play has a lot to do with perfection or doing it right or not making a mistake because then I'll get hit or I'll get in trouble or whatever. And so uh, and the music therapist just sort of models that this is just about being together. It's not about doing anything right or perfectly. Um, And sometimes it might be the first time in a client's life that they weren't, you know, being scrutinized or graded or, you know, yelled at for something. And, And so it might be the beginning of a whole new level of expression. And once that expression starts to open up, that's when um, a lot of the the trauma memories and emotions can be externalized and and healed. And what I find with the singing bowls is almost every time I do it or anyone that I'm working with does it, they sigh. (sighs) We hold our breath all the time particularly traumatized people, people that are hypervigilant. They breathe in and they don't breathe out. And then suddenly you hear, (sighs) So, you know, if you notice clients like that or friends or relatives, you probably would get really good effects giving them a singing bowl or Tibetan um, tinkshas, their little, little bells that you click together or um, other kinds of um, gongs and things like that, or there's little, um, you know, there's like a little thing with the three bars on them and they each have this beautiful little tone. The vibration from those kinds of instruments are very soothing. And that's a very important part of music therapy uh, for trauma, is to uh, teach your clients ways of coping with their anxiety. So doing breathing exercises along with music. Like for example, I'll have people breathing um, in rhythm to like um, let it be, you know? So breathing in, when I find myself in times of trouble out, Mother Mary comes to me in, speaking words of wisdom out, let it be. You know, learning that your breath can be rhythmic. We don't have to breathe in, hold our breath, or breathe out and not breathe in again. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? That's one of the patterns that happens in traumatized people. They do not have a regular breath rhythm. Don't you find that a lot in, in your clients? And music might be the only way. I mean, music naturally uh, creates rhythm in the body-mind, right? Brain waves become coherent. Breathing patterns become coherent. Blood pressure becomes stabilized, right? Um, So all of these things naturally come into balance with music. But if you bring that to your client's attention, then they can consciously use music to stabilize their breathing, particularly when they're scared. You know, self-care is absolutely essential for people who have been traumatized. And I always think about, like, Freud doing all his analysis with his patients that a lot of them were terribly traumatized, but he never gave them any tools to take home with with them. So they kept coming back for (laughs) years and years and years and years. You know, but these days, we therapists, we want to 
give our clients things that they can use at home to continue the therapy process and not just become dependent on you as a therapist. Everybody has what I call, in my, my title of my book is called Essential Musical Intelligence. We are all born with musical intelligence. It's one of the eight intelligences that Howard Gardner talks about in his book of understanding human nature. And so people can say, I can't carry a tune, probably because somebody told them that. No one would say that about themselves because everyone sings, that's normal. You know? So yeah, I've never, I had one patient that said no to me. He was a cancer patient and he was so bombarded with people coming in, of his, in and out of his room all day long. And I came in happy, smiling with my instruments, and he's like, no, get out. And I was like, okay, you got it. You know, but other than that guy, with thousands of people I've worked, on, worked with, no one has ever not been able to improvise or to sing or whatever. <laughs> Signing off, thank you for being a great audience.